Uh, but we love you, and right now I want you to grab your Bibles, and if you haven't yet collected some, something to take communion with, preferably something to eat and drink, that would be great. Uh, I suppose it could be a cinnamon roll, but I'd prefer for you to like, uh, you know, get a little piece of bread and a cup of juice of some kind. We're going to take communion today, family, online and right here, uh, so we're excited about that. Wow, how are you doing? Some of you were concerned because I wasn't here the last two weeks, and I think you assumed I got COVID. I think you assumed I tested positive uh, for COVID. I didn't test positive for COVID. I tested positive for rest. <laughs> Come on now. Somebody say amen. So I'm good. My family is good. We're healthy. Thank God. Praise God for that. Every day is a new day that we trust God. Amen. amen. And um, so here I am. And I want you to take your Bibles, and I want you to open them to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to take a pause with Acts. Uh, I sense that we were in some good momentum in Acts, but I, I felt just compelled over the last week or so to kind of put that study on pause for just a moment and to really look at some of the Advent themes. And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 today, and I'll join you there in, in just a few minutes. Uh, what are the dangers of those of us that have been following Christ for a long time, uh, is that when we come to the Christmas season, we act like adults and not kids. And what I, what I mean by, somebody was just saying, well, what's wrong with acting like an adult and not a kid? Uh, what, what, what I mean by that is, when, when I was a kid, Christmas was a big deal. Uh, and presents were a big deal. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I could tell you stories about, about these special gifts that I got along the way as a kid, and, um, and I just think sometimes as adults, we approach this season with our head and not our heart. Uh, we know the story well. We've read Luke so many times. Uh, we, we can recite the, the passages, and, and I want to invite you this season, whether you've been following Christ for a long time, or you just came to faith in Christ, or you're seeking God, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Oh, this is good. I want to stand up. Stand up. And I want to invite you to pray this, this prayer with me this morning. And, and I, I, I feel like I'm being a little overdramatic. Now, some of you expect that from me. But I want you to pray this prayer and ask God to give you something special this season. Something that, that you'll look back on 2020 and, and you'll look back on 2020 and, you'll, and you'll, you'll remember that God gave you this gift and it changed your life. <laughs> like, I just, I, I want to invite some of you are like, oh, that's just too dramatic, John, and I don't want to do that because I don't want to be disappointed. Well, okay, but I'm going to invite you to do it anyway. And I don't want to be over dramatic, but I want to invite you to, to ask God to open your mind up, open your emotions up, open your life up to receive something from God this year that, that will change your life. So here's the prayer. You're going to pray this with your eyes open looking at me. Uh, so get your hands up here. Uh, put your Bibles down. Uh, that, that sounded heretical. Put your Bibles down. Uh, if you're online now, come on, focus with me. Focus with me right here. I'm going to look right in this camera right here. Okay? Uh, so here's the prayer. Um, uh, we should do this like a, like a wedding or something. I'll say a few words and then you repeat after me. Okay? Now, some of you are skeptical already. And you're like, ah, but what am I supposed to do? Stay seated and not talk? No, you're not going to do that. So for you, my prayer is that these words won't just be kind of a repetitive thing, but that God will use them and they'll start to settle deep into your, your heart and your, and your soul, okay? So here it is. God, I'm looking to receive something special from you this year. I don't know exactly what it is or how you will deliver it to me, but I'm confident that you have something for me this Christmas. That will significantly change my life. And I want to be ready to receive it. Holy Spirit, fill me up. And stir me up. 
to see it and receive it as coming from your good hand for me this Christmas in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Oh, my goodness. Now, we often forget that the Christmas story comes in a, in a time in history that was, um, that was, that was difficult and, and that people were struggling in, right? Contrary to kind of the hallmark myth, Christmas in the first century was not a season of good vibes and tasty treats. One of my kids walked out into the living room the other day with this sweatshirt that said good vibes. And I just thought, you know, that's kind of the hallmark version of, of, the, of the Christmas story. But, but as we go back and we review the context around the Christmas story, we realize that at the time of Jesus' birth, God's people, Israel, had been in exile for some 400 years, having not heard from God, no prophet coming and giving them a word of encouragement or a word of hope, 400 years of silence. They were under Roman rule, and it was a cruel Roman rule. And this is why Isaiah, in prophesying about the coming of the Messiah, says, the people walking in what? Darkness. Yeah, it, it, when Isaiah looked forward under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he saw a time when the people were walking in darkness. They weren't walking in the light. They weren't walking in prosperity. It wasn't the golden years of the nation of Israel. Isaiah, looking forward under the inspiration of the Spirit, knew that Jesus was going to come into a time of darkness, and he describes it as that. And it wasn't a 10-month Darkness. Come on now. It had been 400 plus years of darkness. And it had been around for generations. Ruled by other nations. No prophet coming. And it's into that context that the Christmas story is, is told. And what's kind of surprising as we read the Christmas story is that even though it comes into the context of darkness, the recipients of this gift teach us something about hope. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk a little bit about, about hope. And I want us to look at Mary's song. Luke chapter 1, your Bibles are open. If you're online, please make sure you have a Bible. We're going to take some notes together as well. Luke chapter 1. Mary... Uh, comes to visit, the angel has come and announced to Mary already that she is pregnant with the Christ child. She then goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, and there's this exchange uh, just before the words that Mary sings in verse 30, uh, starting in verse 46. Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, and, and Elizabeth is pregnant as well, right? So we have these two pregnant ladies, and uh, it's this beautiful story of uh, these babies connecting with one another in the womb, so to speak. Do, 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 do. I mean, I'm just saying. And Elizabeth declares something over Mary. And at the end of that little exchange, verse 45, uh, Elizabeth says, Blessed is she, meaning Mary, blessed is Mary, who has what? Believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Hope begins when you and I believe that what the Lord has declared will be accomplished. Whew! You cannot have biblical hope until you put your faith, your belief, your trust into the character and the promises of God. And Elizabeth declares this statement over Mary, Blessed are you, Favor is on you because you have believed that what the Lord has said to you will be accomplished. And then Mary busts out in this song. We call it Mary's Song. It's a wonderful song. And I want to just look at it quickly and walk through it uh, with you. I see kind of three uh, aspects of, 
of hope in this. And so uh, we'll put this up on the screen. I just kind of want to walk you through it, starting in verse 46. And Mary says, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Verse 48, For he has been mindful. It's this wonderful Hebrew word that describes God's consistent gaze, intentional gaze to show favor on his children. (laughs) It's used in the Old Testament in several places to describe the fact that God is a God who pursues us not to destroy, but to grant us and to show his favor to us. It's a wonderful word. And Mary says, he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Here's the first thing. Write this down. Hope because God is aware of our present situation. Is this up on the screen for me? Look, there it is. Hope because God is aware of my present situation. I think sometimes we forget this reality that God, even and maybe especially when things are not want them to go, we forget that God is aware of and he's present, and he's actively looking to be present in our situation and to visit us with his grace and his mercy. Last night, I had the privilege of praying with a couple who came to the Christmas tree lighting event, and uh, afterwards, uh, we're just kind of standing there, and I was kind of prompted by the Holy Spirit to come up and and, uh, and have a conversation with them, to only to find out that they had lost their 28-year-old son in October of this year. And uh, I, I began to weep inside at the, at the pain and the loss that they were experiencing. And tears just started to flow down the mom's, the mom's eyes. And uh, I was able to just stand there and pray with them and remind them that God is present in your loss, that God is present in your pain. And it's not a passive presence. It's an active presence. The Hebrew word here is a word that's used in Psalm chapter 23 of God's grace and mercy, his loyal love, his chesed that pursues us in the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our darkness. (laughs) Ha <laughs> ha! I can have hope because God is aware of my present situation. I received a text message yesterday from another family at Grace Church who had a, a grandchild who was um, just in the kitchen and uh, kind of followed, followed dad over to the microwave and, and happened to just grab a bowl of hot soup and, and pour, it, pour it over him rushed him to the ER, and so I get this text message kind of in the middle of the day, and, and uh, I just began to pray for God's presence and for God's power, and that that family would, would sense that God is mindful of them, that God is actively mindful of the circumstances and situations that you are in, and hope is present be, not because of our circumstances, but because God is present in those circumstances and he's aware of what's going on around us. Listen now at verse 49, Mary moves on to say we can have hope because we can see God's involvement over the past generations. Verse 49, are you there? For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. It's it's hope because we can see God's involvement over past generations. Mary must have been a student of the scripture. She, She quotes lots of Old Testament passages and stories, even in this song. And as she looks back, not just in her own life, but in the life of the nation of Israel, she sees God's direct involvement on behalf of his people. And this brings her hope. 
It's, it's not hope based on your current circumstances. It's hope because God has been actively pursuing you and God has been actively involved, not in my, only in my own life, but in the life of his children and his nation all along the way. And Mary, in looking back, sees and remembers that God showed up in other places of darkness and was faithful to his promises. And this brings hope to you and to me. When we look back on our lives and we see how God showed up and how God was consistent and how God miraculously sometimes and unexpectedly oftentimes showed up and delivered a gift to you and to me. Amen? I mean, it's not hope based on your current circumstances. It's hope based on the character and involvement of God. Now look what Mary continues to say in verse 52. He brought down rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers, there is a sense of hope because God is for me and not against me. As Mary looks back on the history of her people and he, she looks back on the history of her own life, let us just remember Mary is a teenager pregnant to a poor carpenter. And they're not married yet. This is not a good situation for her. And yet as she looks beyond her situation into the involvement of God throughout the ages, she realizes that God is for her and not against her. And hope comes to you and I because God is for me and not against me. And God is for you and not against you. It's been helpful for me to think about hope in terms of a placeholder. Check this out. Check this out. Um, the word hope is used, often used to describe something that I'm looking forward to. Uh, put this next slide up for me. Worldly hope, or hope that the world offers, is the belief that if something occurs, I will be satisfied and safe and happy. So just work with me for just a second. The word hope, is, it's kind of a placeholder. Like, and I just, I just thought about some things, some events, some possessions, some people, some circumstances, right? I'm going to be happier. I'm going to have hope if only... This pandemic goes away. I knew I'd get an amen on this one. If only COVID-19 would go away, then I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be fulfilled, right? So, so you fill in your blank. What's your blank this year? What's your blank today? What's your blank this week, right? What, what are you looking forward to happening so that you can get out of your present funk and into what God wants you to be, right? Okay, what about, possess oh, if only I had, <sighs> if, if only, come on, do I need to fill this in for you? Are you filling it in yourself? If only I had a better job. If only I was the lead pastor of that church. Oh, come on now. Ralph's looking at me like, oh, John, don't go there. <laughs> right? Po like possessions. Like well, the scripture talks a lot about this. Oh, if I, could just, if I could just have a little bit more, if I have a little better job or, or, or a little bit more money or a nicer car or, if, or, or if, you know, what, 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 whatever, if I, if I could just have that, well, then I would be happy. If, if only my kids would be like their kids. Then my life would be fulfilled, right? Or, or, or if, if, only, if only that person would do this, then, then, I, then I would be able to kind of work through my pain and, and be able to get on the other side. Or maybe it's just circumstances, right? If, if, if only I were not living in California. Let me come over. They're getting bored over there. I got to come over here. Right? Like, what are the circumstances that you're in that you, you hope is just a placeholder? Like, okay, if, if, this if this will just change, if only this will change, then I can step into a better life, a more fulfilled life, a happier life. 
If, if, only, if only I knew this person or could get to know this person or was a part of this person, then I would be able to fulfill everything that God called me to be and to do, right? It's, it's hope based on the circumstances that, that are, are yet to come. Now, check this out. Are you ready for this? Biblical hope is not a if only. Biblical hope is a because God. Say this, because God. Worldly hope is if only. Say, if only. if only. Biblical hope is because God. because God. Biblical hope is not based on your circumstances. That's what Mary is saying here. It's not based on her circumstances. It's based on the character and promises of God and the faithfulness of God showing up over generations of time. Mary is saying, oh man, thank you God for gazing down and seeing my situation. It's not that my situation doesn't matter or my circumstances don't matter. Oh no, my circumstances matter a lot. It's just my hope isn't based on my circumstances. My hope is based in the character and promise of God. So biblical hope is not if only this would happen. Biblical hope is because God is in control of the universe, I can have peace. If you place your hope in your circumstances, you will always be disappointed. There is only one aspect of biblical hope that is future-looking. We're going to get to that in a minute. So hang in there. I haven't completely lost my marble. Some of you are like, oh, but John, biblical hope is about looking forward. Yeah, it is. But biblical hope, first and foremost, is about looking back to the cross, to the gospel. It's because God is in control of the universe, I can have peace. It's because God is already enough for me. I can be satisfied, Paul says, with a little bit or a lot. It's because God continues to love me. I can extend that same love to other people around me. It's because God, because Christ lives inside of me, I can have joy in all my circumstances. And Mary is, okay, go back to this text. Go back to this text. Mary is simply describing for us biblical hope. My soul glorifies in the Lord, she says. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, because he has been mindful of me. He has been involved in my life. He has made a promise, and I believe that that promise is going to come to fulfillment. Therefore, I will have joy and peace. Not because of my circumstances, but because of his great mercy and love. And notice, let me go back to the first part there of verse 48. For he is mindful of the humble state of his servant. Mary teaches us in this that we don't deserve God's grace and mercy. We haven't earned his grace and favor. It comes because God desperately loves to give special gifts to those that he loves so much. I wonder in your life and in my life in this season, what are the circumstances that God has placed you in right now that he wants to break through and give you a special gift. And I want to invite you right now. In fact, why don't we do this right now? I want, you inv- I want to invite you to just close your eyes. And I want you to think about and ask God right now, ask the Holy Spirit right now to begin to reveal to you That place in your life where you have taken your trust and your hope and you've placed it in something or someone other than the person and work of Jesus Christ. I want you to just talk to the Holy Spirit right now and just ask the Holy Spirit, God, Holy Spirit, would you reveal to me 
an, an area of my life. Maybe it has to do with possessions. Maybe it has to do with events. Maybe it has to do with circumstances. Maybe it has to do with relationships. And just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, reveal to me right now in this moment an area of my life where where I'm placing my hope In an if only. Stay with me, stay with me. I know this awkward silence is like, oh, John, come on. But there's power in just being quiet and asking the Holy Spirit. Reveal to me where my, where my hope has been placed in an if only instead of a because God. And as the Holy Spirit begins to reveal that to you, that area of your life, that circumstance, that, that thing that you've been wanting to change and then you can be more fulfilled, as the Spirit of God begins to reveal that to you, op- open your heart, open your mind, open up your emotions and ask God, ask the Holy Spirit, to begin to shift your trust away from that if only this happens to because God is present. so difficult for me personally um, to, to be in this kind of a setting right now and to be silent and just to be listening for the voice of God in my own life. And I want to I encourage you right now like just to lean in, just to lean in. We started the service this morning by asking God to give us a special gift this year. And by asking God to to give us the the eyes to see it and to perceive it and to embrace it when when it does come. But that's going to require us to shift our hope away from our current circumstances and into the very character and person of God. So Holy Spirit, I pray right now for everyone here on the plaza and everyone listening online, 
Would you move us as a family of yours to place our hope not in the if only something's going to happen, but in the because God has come and broken through the silence. The people, in walk, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. God, help us to see your presence and your power and to place our hope, our faith, our confidence in you and not in our circumstances. And God, in that, we're praying that you would give each and every one of us a special gift. That Christmas 2020 would not be remembered for all the division and the strife and the, and the things that are going on around us, but for the year that you came and showed up in a dramatic and special and supernatural way and delivered something to each and every one of us. Because you loved us. And you care deeply about us. And so, God, I pray you would help us to believe. Not because we deserve it, but because we are your children, bond servants. And so we anticipate in the weeks, the days and weeks to come, God, that you will break through the silence, that you will break through the darkness, that you will break into the struggle, that you will break into the pain, that you will show up in the hurt and the anxiety, that you will, um, you will divinely and supernaturally give us words of wisdom with our families and our neighbors and those co-workers and those people that you have strategically and supernaturally placed in our life. God, would you open up the heavens and pour out your favor like you did on Mary? Would you pour your gifts of favor and grace and mercy and wisdom and power and presence Help our eyes to see beyond our circumstances and to place our hope in you. And then, God, would you give us the courage to speak that hope into the lives of those that you have put around us There are people walking in darkness around us that have yet to see the light of your favor and your grace and your plan of redemption. And so like Mary, God, would you give us uh, the courage and the faith to sing your song to that person who desperately needs to know that you love them so much that you sent your only begotten son born in a humble to a humble family who didn't deserve any of it but because of your grace and mercy and love and your plan you came you sent the savior God, thank you for the bread and the cup that we're going to take in remembrance of the sacrifice that you made for each one of us. Uh, guide our thoughts now uh, as we look back to the cross and what you did for us. May it inspire us, God, to be faithful to you in anticipation of your second coming. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, amen.
I want to invite you to take your communion cup. Did you get a communion cup as you came in? Everybody has a communion cup. If you are watching online, hopefully you have a, a cup and a, a piece of bread or something to eat. The juice represents, um, juice represents the blood of Christ. Paul says, without the shedding of the blood of Christ, there is no forgiveness of sin. And the bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for each one of us. I've asked the band to sing this wonderful song. Would you stand up with me? I'm going to lead you in actually taking the elements uh, after we sing this song together. So just an incredible song uh, about the hope, the living hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So I want to invite you right now as we sing this song to take a deep breath and just open up your hands like this again and receive from God what, what he has for you. We, we, don't, we don't want to be different. We want to be different having been here and met with God today. Amen. I love what Amber said early in the service. Like God changed me today. Help me to leave here different than what I came, than when I came. And, and I believe God wants to do that. Like, I, I believe that God, every time we meet together and we open his word and we sing together, that the Holy Spirit is present here and he wants to change you and he wants to change me. Amen? So let's open ourselves up now as the band sings this song over us about the living hope that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there's sin that you need to confess, do it during this song. <laughs> right? If you've been trusting in, in things that, that come and go, then now is the time to just put your hands up and say, God, I'm sorry, forgive me. Uh, you died for my sin. You paid the penalty for my, my hopelessness. And right now, I, I ask for you to forgive me from that. And I ask you to, to come into my life again and to restore me. Like, I, Have a conversation with God as we prepare to take communion today. Don't just let this moment, like, you know, fly over your head. What is God saying to you right now? What is the Holy Spirit directing you? How is he convicting you of the fact that you've placed your hope in something other than the character and purposes and plan that God has for you? This is the living hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Sing this, sing this, man. This is a powerful song. 